Welcome to The Driven Entrepreneur, where we sit down with visionaries, trailblazers, and entrepreneurs and discover why and how they do what they do. We'll get the backstory, plus plenty of life and business lessons along the way. Here's your host, Matt Browning. Hey, this episode is brought to you by my very own NLP Practitioner Course. I've been teaching Neuro Linguistic Programming, or NLP, for nearly 15 years. It is the most powerful tool for communication on the planet, and it can be yours today. For a very limited time, I'm giving away my entire NLP course workbook for free. Go to nlpwithmatt.com. All the patterns, all the tools, and the techniques of NLP in the complete course workbook, the same one that we use to teach our live certification classes, yours free. NLPwithmatt.com. Get it today. Let's get back to the show. Hey, what's going on? Hello. Welcome back to The Driven Entrepreneur. It's Matt Browning, and we are ready to crank on life, ready to get moving on everything that life is as an entrepreneur. And you know, on the show, we're always talking, whether it's business tactics, we're talking about stories of amazing entrepreneurs and what made them. But some of the things we've been doing a lot more lately is getting into this kind of entrepreneur life. And whether it's, you know, some of the recent guests we've had, and we've had conversations about travel hacks, or we had uh, our dog trainer talking about having uh, the psychology that we use in training dogs to how to train ourselves and how to train our own behaviors. And today we have Something to me, it's right along those lines of something that's going to make your life just that much more powerful and that much more amazing. And I'm talking about decluttering, decluttering your life, decluttering your house, decluttering your office, clutter. Maybe you're a closet hoarder. Look, no judgment for me, but maybe that's something you've been struggling with and you don't have a lot of people to talk about it, it with. Um, maybe it's just kind of trying to get organized and always having stacks of papers and post-its all over your desk. Whatever it is, clutter is killing your cash flow. And with me today to talk about this and how you can take charge of your space is professional organizer, feng shui practitioner, and productivity coach, Miss Organized Herself, Tracy Pay. Tracy, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing amazing. How are you, Matt? So, so, so uh, happy to be on your show, finally. <laughs> I know. We've been trying to get this done man. for a couple of months, but here we are. Here we, here we are. are. I love it. And I, th I feel like if I had less clutter in my life, I probably would have gotten you on sooner. I am literally looking at this as I, as I look to the left. Yeah, I had this pretty little background on my desk, but then I got this. I got this. These oh, stacks of, of notes what, and paper. What is going on? I don't know. And it's like, this is how, here's, here's why I want to talk to you. This is how my brain works. And I, if you're obviously, if you're listening, like you can hear the paper rustling. I have notes upon notes and I write them down and I stack them and then I think I'm going to get through it and I'm going to organize it. I feel like my brain is a little bit of chaos with thought process. And sure. I believe my space is reflecting that. Mm -hmm. What is your take on that? Am I wrong? Am I right? Um, <laughs> what have you seen in, in your 35 years professional experience? Does, does our space reflect our minds? If so, how? 100% it does. It absolutely does. There is so much of a connection between what's going on inside your head, what's going on with your emotions, and what's showing up in your physical environment. It's all connected. And as far as your paperwork situation over there, it's really not that bad. You're an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs, very ten we have tendencies to just have so much thought in our heads, it never stops. Our brains just never turn off. And we're part business and we're part creativity. And we got to get it out of our, we got to get it out of our brains. And there's no problem with that whatsoever. I'm going to say two parts to what you just showed me. One, well, first, can you text my wife and tell her there's no problem? Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. She's That's, awesome. We have our own absolutely. little space stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've already got so much to say about that. Let's, let's uh, note, note uh, that the organizing styles, I really would love to get into that. With that you sounds great to me. Yeah. That, that just what you said about your wife, I can clear that up immediately, but sounds no, great. you're not, you're not wrong. But what part of what you need without diving down into this too far is part systems and part just understanding that that's a way of brain dumping. Sometimes we just need to take information and put it down on a piece of paper just to get it out of our heads to brain dump, which is a technique I teach my clients as a way for their brains to get clear so they could get back, uh, so they can get their focus 
So they become more focused. You know, the more clear the brain is, the more focused you can be. And that's why it's so important to have a clear working environment because then that will help you be more focused, which will help you be more productive, which will affect the bottom line, which is, which is your cash. Yes. Come on. That's very, very good. <laughs> so clear mind, clear cash flow, everything else. So talk to me a little bit about, well, you know, before we get into some of the practical tips, I want to know how, how you got into this in the first place. When you were a kid, when you were a little girl, were you always the, the, the clean one? Were you like play? My, my wife tells a story how she was remember being a little girl and she would sweep out the potholes in her street. She brought a broom out and swept out the potholes because it was My just so woman right satisfying. There. Yeah. <laughs> and it, so, but she really loves like, you know, when she gets to cleaning, it's very like a meticulous sort of a thing. When you were a kid, were you like, like that? Did you really love organizing and things or is it something that yes. you grew up non-organizing? No, you loved no, it. I, oh, absolutely. Yeah. My earliest memory was 12 and I had a friend and I go to her house to play and I'd walk in the house and there was nothing but clutter. And I didn't even know what clutter was. I just knew that I walked in. I was like, oh my God, look at all this stuff. So you didn't have and that at your house? No, uh, -uh no. My mom's a clean freak, okay. absolute clean freak. Um, and, and that's where I get a lot of my clean freakness from. But I went to her room and her room was just as cluttered. And I'm not sure at the time at 12 years old, what I was thinking or feeling, but knowing what I know now about what clutter does, I'm sure I probably felt overwhelmed I'm sure I probably felt like I could not focus on doing anything in, in that room because there was just so much stuff. So I must have convinced her to let me start doing some cleaning and organizing. And we did. I don't remember how far I got, but I do remember that she stopped inviting me over. <laughs> <laughs> and like, hey, let's play another game. Let's clean your closet out. She's like, can we do a different game? <laughs> Just want to play Barbies. Well, you got to so, find your Barbies first. <laughs> so you always love that. And you oh, know, yeah. I, I've talked to, you know, over my life, a few different people that are really big and organizing. And one of the things that you mentioned as well is systems. And mm -hmm. I try to like the one thing that always stuck in my mind is if you don't have a system for say, like where something quote lives, where it goes, all of a sudden it's going to be clutter. And I find yeah. little things like, can you speak to like the small systems in our life? Maybe not the overarching, but car keys. Where does my phone go at night? We moved to a new house and I realized I didn't have a nightstand for a while. And it was like, I was always losing my chapstick and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it's like, how do you figure out a system for where things live? And what's uh, maybe even the philosophy, however you want to approach that topic. Hmm. I think the first thing you have to identify is how you think. Okay. And this goes back to what I was going to say about organizing styles. So let me just dive into that for a moment, if you don't mind, give me a little foundation to uh, how I would go about creating systems. Sounds great. So, okay. So there, there's a book uh, called Organizing the Disorganized Child, uh, Dr. Moran, I believe is her name. And it identifies three different organizing styles. One of them is visual. Another one is chronological. And another one is a creative slash spatial. So each one of those styles is very much like a learning style and it dictates how you like your stuff and how you handle your stuff. As an example, a visual, those are the ones who tend to have the things out, like they like to see it. The whole out of sight, out of mind thing scares them. So they're the ones who have the paper piles. So maybe their system is on their desk and they've got like 10 piles in front of them. And to somebody who's chronologically minded, who would have the labels and the folders in the drawer, would look at those piles on the desk and think, that's a mess. But to the visual, they're like, whoa, 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 that's my system. You know, oh, whoa, you, oh, you want the recipe for the chicken marsala, you know? And they know right where it is, don't they? Know, they know exactly which pile it is. Man, when I was in the mortgage business, I started off, I was 18, and there was a guy, um, you might be listening, so shout out to David, love you, buddy. He was in charge of all the telemarketers and the number one sales guy, and he had definitely visual system. But I walked in, I thought, slob, it's chaos. And he literally had just piles of applications, papers. He didn't have them in folders, he had piles. I'm not exaggerating, maybe 30, 40 on his desk and then all over wow. the, the ground. Oh, and he gosh. had sticky notes. That guy went through stick and the sticky notes everywhere. But I'm telling you, I was oh like, what gosh. is going on? And he would just go, oh yeah, no, no, this isn't my fault tomorrow. This is these guys. This is the ones I need to send the email remind. And he knew yeah. exactly where it was. Exactly. But That's not one person thought he was organized. 
Isn't that interesting? Deep. And there's so much, so so much psychology I could dive into just going in that on that path to explain a lot of that behavior. But oh, stop me from going there because there's just so much more to talk about. Well, let's come about, back to but... the foundation, and we might have time to dive into it. Okay. So said chronological is going to be more labels, more folders. Yeah, yeah. They 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 tend to be more the minimalist type. They would be, say, for instance, at school. Say you're in high school, and you have you are the chronological type. You have a locker. I don't even know if they do lockers anymore. But let's just say you have a locker. And your math class was first, and your English class, your English class is second. You'd probably put your math book at the very front. And then you put behind it, you put your English book. That's that's how a chronological person would think. So how that translates with their stuff, it's interesting. The difference between a visual and a chronological, when they lose things, a chronological would go, when was the last time I remember using it? Versus a visual would go, where was the last time? I remember seeing it. Where was the last place I remember seeing it? That's fascinating. See what I'm saying? Oh, it's fascinating. And let me tell you something. Never the, 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 there's one more style. And then I'll tell you the reason why, after I learned this, how I really use this in my business to, to set up systems for every person in the household, not just one person, but, but you know everybody in the household sometimes has to use the same system. So it has to work for everybody. So you have to integrate everybody's styles into the way that you have things set up in the house. Uh, but the last style, organizing style, is called cozy slash spatial. That is what I predominantly am. And cozy spatials are, we need to feel good in our space. So something like a chair, if you're sitting at your desk and your chair doesn't feel good, you're going to have a difficult time focusing because in the back of your mind, you're going to be thinking to yourself, this chair doesn't feel good. Or maybe you're cold or maybe you're hot. You know, we're sensitive to our environments. Uh, kids, how that looks like for kids is they like their beds pushed up into corners because they like that kind of cozy, nooky kind of feel. They're the ones who like a bunch of stuffed animals around them. They're the ones who like the, the, the blankets. If they have a piece of clothing they're wearing, then they might say, oh, mommy, daddy, this is too tight. Or I could feel the, the um, tag on the back of this. You know, we're just really sensitive. So that being said, I like to set up environments to, to honor that same with like how you manage information. I find that people tend to be either more comfortable with paper, which explains your 30 pile guy versus electronics. I think there's a healthy balance between the two. I think there's, and that's what I think your solution is, by the way, is, you know, being able to express your creativity freely and get, get that information out of your brain onto, you know, paper without feeling like you have to be in edit form while you're doing it or, right. or organized form. Um, but then take that information that's that needs to be actionable and put it into a system. Yeah, you, you know, you, I mean, you're describing you're describing my life here, and I feel like <laughs> I, so let me just give you some feedback. I feel like I'm probably strongest visual for mm -hmm. sure. And it's interesting that you know, in the world of neuro linguistic programming NLP, I have a whole training company where we teach all this stuff, not your stuff, but I see how it relates so much to the visual auditory kinesthetic. Most people realize that the auditory style and what we call the, the, the representational system is very um, analog and chronological. Oh. Yeah, so it, it, I call it sequential. I've never called it chronological. Let me take that back. But we call it sequential where they, they love steps and they right. start from one and right. eight. Exactly. And you're describing that. It, it makes perfect sense. Um, so I'm strong as visual for sure. And I get a little bit of panic where it's like I use... Dropbox and electronic, you know, my folders and the computer, but there's a little bit of underlying panic of like out of sight, out of mind. Sure, of course. And I think that's one of my, my, my motivational things. Could you speak to, I don't know, maybe just that side. I'm worried that if I don't have it in front of me, I all of a sudden, like I can have total peace. If I have a big to-do list, but it's away, or I put it into my notes in my phone and then I don't open up that folder, it's gone. Mm. which can make me very unproductive. I can be flaky and I don't want to be, but I forget to call someone back because, oh yeah, mm. I, I tried to get organized. You know what I mean? I have these I do. emails I and do. Facebook messages and calendar things and all we this stuff. So much. I wrote them all oh down so I'd remember. And then I, I don't look at the list and they're all gone. And then poof. <laughs> yeah, but if they're in front of me and I write yeah. it all down here, it looks like a mess, right. but I see it. Where my wife yeah, is also absolutely. very spatial cozy. I mean- yeah. Big time. She wants pillows in the bed. She wants to sleep against pillows. Um, and everything. This is so Tracy. I'm sorry to take so much time. We'll go a little long. Mind blown, right? No, it really is. Because even how like she she does the design for the house and I do the practical stuff. So even how it's like what pictures go on the wall. 
for me, it's all well, just look at it and set it up symmetrically or visually or whatever. But she has to have me try this, try that, move these around, and then just get a feel of is that how the wall should feel? And it's it's all that way. This is so interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love this stuff. So that's my life. Okay, so let, come back to <laughs> let, let's let's fix me. Okay, so um, <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so oh my God, there's so much that can be said about what you just said. Um, Give me some trigger things about what you just said to remind me about what I was going to say. Uh, (laughs) Because there's so many different things I could tell you right now, but. um, How how about this? Why don't we talk about the kind of a a good system that works? So when I think of myself as a visual organizer, I know that I can get cluttered and get stuff out of hand. Right. That's a way that rather than fighting my nature, because I want to have file cabinets. I think I want that, but I don't really want that. Mm. First time in my life in 40 years, you're telling me that maybe I don't have to have that. What is Yes, you don't have to have it. I'm setting you free. You're free. <laughs> what does a visual filing cabinet look like? How about that? Okay, well, now I now I remember what I was going to say to you. I'm not going to answer your question directly. I'm going to answer it hopefully indirectly, which is giving you more foundational information about information. Okay? Couldn't be more excited. Uh, okay, good. So let's, let's talk about information. We, usually information comes to us in the form of um, paper or it comes to the form of us in the form of like an email or it comes in the form of some sort of a communication, whether that be in your own thought, you know, you've got something in your head and you write it down on a sticky note, that's information that you have to manage, right? Um, or a conversation you had with a friend. But either way, there's information that we have to manage. So it's coming at you from paper, from email, or we'll say, we'll say electronic, right? So you got, you got the paper, you got the electronic, and then you've got the, um, the human communications, the only way I can think about it right now. But you have to manage all of that information. And part of systematizing is understanding, well, let me take another step back here. I have a system I created, I call the prepare to act system, and it manages the tasks and the related paperwork to those tasks. So what I call actionable tasks. Those are the kinds of tasks that are, you get the dentist postcard in the mail. It says, hey, it's time for you to schedule your appointment. That's an actionable task. You have to, you don't have to, but you have to manage that piece of paper, right? That has that information on it and the task of getting to the dentist. So the way I identify um, information is to think about it this way. You're either going to have to just file it away. Actually, let me take another step back. In my system, step number two, I'm an 80s child. So I had to find a word. I had to find a way to use the word rad because it is my favorite word in the world. So rad. rad, rad, right? I mean, I use it every chance I get, and I'm like, I have to find a way to use this in my business. You didn't and see I did. the movie Rad Racing, did you? No, should I? Yeah, maybe. It's a BMX '80s. Done. It's the only uh, movie I know of called Rad something. It was fun. They actually have a a dance. I'll watch anything. <laughs> I need, I'm sorry, this podcast needs to end, right? This is good. They, they have a dirty dancing sort of like scene where they're dancing, but they're on bikes doing hops and they're dancing oh, around I have on bikes. Seen that. I have, so I'm going to watch stupid. it again. It's called Rad BMX. Rad Racing. Oh, Rad Racing. I okay, loved I'm, it as a kid, man. Go no, I'm, I'm, abs- I'm absolutely watching that again as soon as I get off this, this podcast. Okay, but, so you're an 80s um, kid. Oh, 100%. And so I found a way to use rad in my business. And I, so like I said, I have this system that I created and step two in the system is rad. And what that stands for is reference action discard. So again, we're dealing with paperwork and the tasks that come from that paperwork. So what I have my clients do in step number two, and this is something you could, you don't even have to have a whole system. You, you can just apply this step immediately to any of your spaces uh, with your paperwork. You just take your paperwork, take a whole pile, put it right in front of you. And, and, you know, sit at a desk or a chair or you know, wherever, dining room table. And like you're spelling out the word left to right, right, R-A-D, you take that stack of paper and you look at it and you're like, oh, this is just reference, which means you just have to file it away. You don't have to do anything with it. You just have to file it away. But we're calling it reference, right? Because we're sticking with rad. So you take that piece of paper, you put it in the R pile for reference file. Then you see another piece of paper, you're like, oh, this is a guy I need to call back. You put it in the action pile in the middle. And then you see another piece of paperwork. You're like, oh, I could just throw this away. And you put it in the D pile. So next thing you know is you've had this, this pile of papers that you have just divided into reference action discard. Does that make sense? Can, can you hear me? Yep, perfect sense. That's all okay. Okay, so yeah. reference so, so action that's discard. discard. Yeah. And let me tell you the beauty of doing that. I want to I dive into so many more of the steps, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to do that little... 
that, that's, that's that little teaser. But let me just tell you what the beauty of doing that step is. That if you see, for most people, if they see a pile of papers in front of them, it is natural to assume you have to do all of that stuff that's in there. Correct. Right, do. That's my to-do pile or whatever. When you do this reference action discard, you will see that only about 25% of that is really actionable. The rest is either file or toss. And when it comes to priorities in your work, your filing does not take priority over your actions. So you could just as easily take that stack of papers that needs to be filed, even though you might want to get to it right away. Like, you know, somebody like me would want to file it right away, but I have to stop myself from doing that. And you could stage it to be done at a later date. So you could focus on just doing those actions. But what happens when people see that perceived workload of 100% get reduced down to 25%, they, their overwhelm levels come down their stress levels come down, their energy goes up and so does their focus and then their productivity. And they're going to get, they're going to be much more inclined to engage in doing those actions because they're not as overwhelmed. Wow. I love that. So, I mean, you just, again, described me when I look at that pile, I keep it all there and I feel like I got to get time and I need to sit down and do, I need to do all this stuff. And what you're saying is some of that I'm actually, and it's funny because some of those notes I'm keeping because I wrote notes about something I was speaking about, or it's a concept or an idea or part of a program. So I can definitely see how some of that's going to be reference. Some of it is action, their sales follow-ups or conversations or things I need to schedule. Yes, exactly. And some of it is probably. Exactly. Don't actually need it at all. Awesome. Yep. So now I've taken all my stuff and I broke it into three piles. Yeah. What? but still I have stuff everywhere. How do I, how do we interact with those people? Maybe we can jump to that. I think that would be a really interesting conversation. So I told you my wife and I, she's very spatial cozy. I'm very visual, but we share Mm -hmm. a bedroom. Mm. How do these (laughs) systems interact? And, you know, I find like so many psychological systems when you just understanding that you have different preferences Right. And create a lot of grace, you know, where it's like, oh, you're not just being a slob, you have a different system, or you're That's not the just beauty of lazy, you're a night yeah. owl, whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. So what advice do you have for us if we're coming at it with sharing physical space, whether it's in the office or at home with these different systems? How do they interact? Or is well, there I'm glad you said, Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you said what you said about having the grace. I find that just in knowing your partner's your kids, your, your boss, you know, whoever, another human beings, organizing styles, just very much like their learning styles or their communication styles or their love styles, right? Once you understand that about somebody else, and then you're willing to compromise, especially when you have to share a space with somebody else and say like, you know what, I like it like this, but I also understand that you like it like this. And you give a little bit of both. Hopefully, if you're in a harmonious relationship where you can work it out in that way, then it would be relatively easy to just, you know, give a little, but just like, you know, hey, I don't like the shoes on the ground, but it's better than having the shoes on the bed. I don't know that. I don't know why I just use that example. So, you know what? I'd rather not have the shoe rack on the ground by the window, but it's better than having the shoes on the bed. I don't know why I just came up with that one. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. Okay. Um, this is really, it's like really a little good. compromise, you know, and, and, and let's just look at the bigger picture of all of this. Really, it comes down to energy. Hmm. It's about creating harmonious energy in any environment that you are in. Okay. So in, especially in the, in the bedroom, that is meant to be a, a sanctuary. For the couple, right? It is meant to be a place of rejuvenation, relaxation, and passion. Let's face it, right? So you don't want in the bedrooms. You don't want like kid stuff in the bedroom. Work I can't stuff tell in you the how bedroom. Many work stuff. On yeah. The bed, all that. Yeah. On the I mean, sometimes desk. you have. Sometimes you just you have to. You know, sometimes people's workspace, you know, homes are so small that that's what they have to do, and that's fine. But just find a way to mitigate the energetic cost of it. So meaning like have a, a Chinese screen that you block off from your desk to your bed. So you, at least you're not seeing your work while, as you're going to sleep. You know, there's things you can do. Not, a, not all is lost, but the more peaceful you can, can make the energy in any space, then everything is going to be better. The productivity is going to be better. The, 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 um, 
the focus is going to be better. The relationships are going to be better. And when we're talking entrepreneurship and your business, bottom line is cash. The better the energy flow. And let me tell you something, not to go too off of a, a, a rabbit hole or a, um, a bunny path here, but one thing that I have definitely noticed in my business is when my energy is low, when I'm burnt out, Yes. that's when all of a sudden the phone stops ringing as much. It so does. People can sense it somewhere out they there. They absolutely it's like, can. If I'm over it, no, somehow people don't want to pay me money. They don't want to work crazy? with me. But as soon Isn't as I'm energized and I'm on fire and I'm like, this is awesome. Right? I mean, there's definitely something to that. Um, so yep. can we, I want to ask about hoarding. And this is, you know, obviously the extreme of the cluttering space. And, you know, I've known people near and dear to my heart over the years that you don't know it. And then all of a sudden you finally see inside their house and you walk mm. in and go, oh my. Isn't look, that something? What, like, how did this happen? <laughs> and I know you, you work a ton on mindset and the psychology of everything too. Yeah. And I think maybe I'll ask it this way not so much what causes it and how, why is all that? Cause you know, that's an interesting conversation, but what do we, a, if we have someone in our life that struggles with that and wants to change, how can we help? What can we do if they don't want to change or they're like, I don't know, these are all the things I love. What's the problem. Do you have advice for, you know, kids of hoarders, uh, siblings of hoarders, that kind of thing. What is your approach when you, when you get called into a situation like that? That's a really tough one. That's, that's a whole different kind of client when I'm dealing it with is. somebody like that. And, and I have definitely dealt with that client and they're tough. I'm not going to lie. They're very, very tough. And I purposely choose not to work with that kind of client anymore because there's a certain level of joy that I need to experience when I am organizing. It's my passion. It's what I love to do. I'm willing to put myself on the front line and experience a lot of the stuff that I have to experience as an organizer. But one, at the end of the day, again, managing my energy, I've learned to uh, who, who I can take on as a client or not. And people who are hoarders, they um, can absolutely get helped by dealing with their physical space, no doubt about it. But a lot of times they, they, they need the psychological counseling to go along with it. Um, because there, there's a lot of reasons to explain why it happens. And let, let's look at this, let's do two prongs to this conversation. Um, the explanation behind it and what you can do about it. Okay. Uh, as far as an explanation behind it, there's a lot of different explanations, but I have found after doing this work for so long, and this was the foundation of my book, like a lot of the content that I got from diving into the psychology and the backgrounds of people as I'm organizing them, enabled me to finally put these uh, connections together. And the connections I've come up with are things like, if they grew up poor, a lot of times they will grow up hoarding later in life. And what I figured out, the reason for that is because they experienced lack. Yes. And they don't want to experience lack anymore, especially if they come into some money. And then even worse, they when they have kids, they don't want their kids to experience the lack. So then they start dumping all the crap on them. And then they take the stuff from all the family members. It's, it's a horrible situation. When I it watch really my grandmother do that as a, as a depression baby. And it's depression, grow, yes. Yeah, and she, exactly. you know, she gave, quick example, she gave for a wedding present to my parents, big stacks of, of uh, towels, which was very nice, except for all of them said Hilton, Howard Johnson Inn. Oh. Right. I mean, and there were, there were these towels that she had taken every time they'd ever stopped in a motel. She goes, well, I mean, we paid for the room, so I should probably bring one of those. And, you know, we had the, you know, the cool whip jars, obviously, yeah, right, salad, right. but it never stopped. It was, that was everything. And my dad definitely learned a piece of that. Um, but yeah, that, that's the, the, the lack piece for sure. Yeah, that, They call that the uh, depression era thinking. And I yeah. see it all the time that that's why working with the senior citizen, which I, I tend not to work with senior citizens only because, you know, you can sense by how fast I talk, you know, how fast I move, you know, and I tend to be like the uh, Tasmanian devil around senior citizens and I make their, their head spin. They're like, Oh, right. Oh, Tracy, you've got to slow down. I can't slow down. I'm not ready. <laughs> Let's just do one thing at a time. And you're like, no, right. transform your life. No. I'm like, Band-Aid's coming off, lady. I don't care if you're <laughs> five. Band-Aid's coming off right now. That's a so good way to put that. Of, 
I don't, I don't deal with a lot of senior citizens, but um, I will tell you that um, they, they really got stuck with the depression era thinking. And I will tell you that the similarity between the way that they thought back then and what we're thinking now is very similar. And the key connection is resourcefulness. Yeah. Back then they were being resourceful. We are also being resourceful, except for it's a different mindset that it is today. Back then, they didn't, for some reason, they thought they had, well, I guess it's, you know, if you think about the toilet paper situation, well, you know, we're, we're not going to dive too far into that, but they are the ones who will have the, the 10 bags of paper bags and they'll stuff them on the side of their fridge because they think they need them someday because they think they're never going to get them again. Whereas here we are, 2020, and we know better that, yes, we're going to get paper bags again. So, but you, you know, can still some, you, but you might still keep them, but it's more like, hey, let's be them. prudent, let's be resourceful, exactly. smart, but not yeah. scarce in a way, it sounds like. What are Absolutely. some, what, what are, I mean, maybe just a tip. So say someone goes, you know, I'm really cluttering bad, um, maybe even hoarding bad, and I want to start something. I want to make a dent. My psychology is that, that I know it's not right, and I want to change something. What's a, where's a good place to start? What's something like something, an actionable, someone could take away and do tonight? There's a couple different ways we can go about this, maybe even three different ways. As far as like physically where you could start, sure. I always tell people the best place to start is your bedroom closet. And the reason why I say that is because, especially if you're sharing a house with other people, it's usually the one space in the house where you have complete control over the decisions that are being made. That's you don't have great. to check in with your husband about the dress that, you know, you, you're considering getting rid of and your husband doesn't have to check it with, you know, it's like you have complete domain and say over your stuff, which will make it easier for you to make those decisions. And the hardest part of getting organized is getting started. So the beautiful thing about starting with the closet is that you're starting off easy. And what you're doing is you're warming up the brain, right? Warm, you're warming up the brain with easy decisions. Giving small wins, right? Absolutely. Small wins. And then what you do is you build momentum. Yes. And after you get all those like little serotonin dopamine hits as well, because you're getting rid of stuff, right? And that is literally what happens. You get dopamine hits and then it's, you know, like getting a little donut or something like, Ooh, I want another donut. And you start getting rid of more stuff. And the next thing you know, you get this, this, um, this uh, momentum, and then you're going to start all different parts of your house. So that's a really great place to start. Another place to start if you're not ready to dive into that quite yet, because some people are not even ready to go to the physical level yet, is to take a notepad. This is what I do with my clients when I first start. I do the, it's called the walk and talk. So I walk into their house, I take a notepad or my iPhone, and I just walk around the rooms. I'm like, you know, just tell me what's working and what's not working. We'll just start there. Mm. And then I let them talk. And next thing you know, they're like, oh, I hate that couch. And oh, my husband, he sits over there. And every time he sneezes, I want to just smack him upside the head and you know just the just <laughs> this dining room table it's not working for us and it's so dark over here and, and they're just everything that's not working all so you don't so you don't ask i love that you said what's working what's not working versus what do you want to get rid of or what do you mm -hmm. want to keep that's a very mm -hmm. different conversation because i feel like that's probably how if i bring an organizer in i'm like oh she's gonna make me get rid of stuff everybody right? thinks that everybody, everybody thinks, thinks that. that they really do but no you just and you, you'll, real, you'll realize it as soon as you get on that conversation with yourself, you're like, oh yeah, I've really hated the way that that dishwasher, every time I pull out the, the racket, it's missing that little wheel. You know, it could be something that simple to fix that if you fix that little tiny thing, oh my God, I promise you, it's like, oh my, you might as well just eat a whole bowl of ice cream. It's amazing. And then you're going to want more of that. And then you're going to continue to do more. So that's another way to start is to just you know, uh, figure out, go walk, do a walk and talk. And then a third way to do this is make a plan. And this is what I always try to do with people before we even start. Sometimes I'll get a plan going right over the phone, you know, whether it's a detailed plan or a mini plan, but I have some sort of idea when I walk in the door, what spaces I'm working on, what the main objectives are that we're trying to achieve. Um, and then every once in a while, I'll walk in and be like, you know what? I'm gonna just gonna let the Holy Spirit talk to me and tell me where we're supposed to go. I mean, really, yeah. I have to do it like that sometimes. But um, if, awesome. if here's, a, here's a little mini way to come up with the plan, okay? To, to figure out where, you, so like I said, the most important part is getting started. But the question always is, where do you start, right? right. So if you create this little mini plan, you might be able to figure this out. And this is how you do it. So a little strategy I created, I call it forward think, like you're moving forward, right? Forward think, backwards plan. Forward think, what is the end goal you're trying to achieve? Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to put a home gym in my garage. That's the, I want to move the, uh, what's the thing I'm, I'm into now, the Peloton. I want to move the Peloton into the garage, right? Well, maybe you have um, a bunch of uh, tires in the way. I don't know why that came to my mind, right? There you so go. So the, the, the end goal is I want to put my Peloton there. And then you use the words if, then to work backwards in your thinking to figure out, well, where do we need to start? So it would look like if I want to put the Peloton, it would sound like if I want to put the Peloton in the right-hand corner of the, of the, of the garage, then I have to move the tires. Gotcha. If I want to move the tires, then I have to find a place to put those tires. I want to put those tires in the shed outside. If I want to put those tires in the shed outside, then I have to get those old rusty bikes out of there. If I get those old rusty bikes out of there, what am I going to do with them? I'm going to take them and donate them. And I'm going to throw them in the trash. So the first step is not putting the Peloton in the garage. The first step is actually getting rid of those bikes so you can make room in the shed, so you can put the tires in the shed, so you can put uh, the Peloton in the space where the tires was. Does that make sense? What a great example. And Isn't really, really smart too. And I'll bet you when you work backwards, you don't, where you end up starting is not maybe where you expect to start, right? Never. It, it almost never is that case. End game. Never is the case. Almost is never so is the case. So good. Yeah, it's good well, hey, we're here with Tracy Pay and her book. Uh, I want to talk about this is If Clutter Could Talk, the stories it would tell. It's available on Amazon, wherever you want to get books. And if you want to follow Tracy, you can follow her at Miss Organized on Instagram and Miss Organized San Diego, uh, where her physical location is, Miss Organized San Diego on Facebook. And it's pay, uh, Tracy Pay, P A Y E, Miss Organized on Instagram. Um, if clutter could talk the stories it could tell, um, I haven't, I, I hate it when I don't have a chance to read the book yet. I know it's good. I trust you. And I know you tell me a little bit about, um, what we expect when we get the book. And cause I want everyone to run Amazon right now and grab it. I know how powerful mm -hmm. it is because of your teaching and your personality, but what are some of the key things that you find out in the book? Thank you so much for, uh, talking about my book. It, basically yeah. it's almost like going through an organizing project. So what it talks about is what brought the client to me in the first place, what happened during the project or even after the project, and what came of the results of the project or the person. And a lot of embedded in their stories, of course, I keep their identities um, confidential, but embedded in the stories is the psychology behind the clutter. So what I have found is that when people read the, this book, they see, uh, they see themselves in sure. one of these clients. And then they're like, oh, well, that's why I'm having a tough time doing this. Or that's why my kid's acting this way. Or that's why my husband won't do this. You know, they just start to become aware of their programming that they receive from children. Because, I mean, that's a whole other conversation itself. But that's really where it starts. The programming that they received as children, how that's playing out in their stuff. And because our stuff is connected to our lives, it, they start to make that connection of how it's showing up in their life and, and the whole connection between it all. And then they start, and I also give practical tips, really super easy little practical tips to do little tiny things to uh, make progress on their own. And I have had people who've told me they've read this book and they were able to get their spaces organized on their own because they were inspired. And once they got inspired, they just, all they had to do was start and get a little bit of that momentum going. And then boop, next thing you know, magic. That's such great stuff, Tracy. So if clutter could talk the stories it would tell, I love that you get some practical tips some wisdom, but you're also teaching through stories and real life examples, anonymous examples, but nonetheless, you can find yourself in the book. Uh, Tracy, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. I really appreciate it. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I feel like we could go on for hours more, uh, mm -hmm. but time is time and, time is time and here we go. But pick up the book, follow Tracy again. You can find her at Miss Organized on Instagram, Miss Organized San Diego on Facebook and grab that book. It clutter could talk the stories it would tell. Tracy Pay, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, guys, that's the show for this week. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this. And I'm telling you, if this is something that's important to you, I can't imagine anyone not finding themselves, even just in the visual, chronological, or spatial, cozy organization structures, because all of us are going to fit into one of those. So, you know, check out the book, go deep into this, and where are you going to start? Decide this weekend to grab one place. Is it the kitchen? Is it the tires? 
Is it the, the Peloton? I don't even know what that is, but whatever you need to move into the garage, is it that? Uh, is it your closet? I'm going to start with this pile of papers, this stuff right here on my desk, and I'm going to rad it and organize it, thanks to Tracy. Get out there this weekend, and don't go out this weekend and be driven. Stay driven in the house, in the office, and do something powerful to change your space. I'm Matt Browning. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, at Matt Browning, and you'll see maybe even some pictures of the organizational principles that I'm going to implement because of Tracy. All right, I'll see you next week with another Driven Entrepreneur. Bye-bye.